In the first part of this lecture, we would like to learn two very fundamental concepts for design, modularity and abstract data types. As usual, we would like to state the learning objectives upon completing this lecture here, so you can always self-assess your knowledge along the way. Objective number one, we would like to learn about the criterion of modularity and try to see if your design is really modular by satisfying that criterion. And number two, uh, we like to talk about abstract data types, or ADTs for short. You may have encountered this concept previously in your data structure course, but as far as this course is concerned, I'm going to give you a slightly narrower definition just for the purpose of this course while being useful. So let's uh, introduce to you the idea about modularity rather than giving you the formal definition, which I will do at the end of this part, but I'll rather like to give you examples. So don't really be afraid about uh, satisfying modularity because it simply exists uh, everywhere in your daily life already. So I would like to start from your childhood. So I'm pretty sure almost every one of you has seen this. So this is the typical uh, Lego pieces. Uh, of course, there might be many other kinds, but that's a typical one. And given such uh, pieces uh, separately, you can actually assemble um, very uh, interesting toy, exciting toy out of your creativity or following some well-designed manual. So that's the first uh, example for modularity. And I would like to use this one to introduce some terms for you. So let me turn into uh, the illustration here. If you think, so think about the green and the blue, uh, uh, two artifacts at different levels. So when we talk about the green over here, so this is at a uh, at a level of modules, and for the modules, uh, you can think about this particular piece over here is module number one, and this particular piece, another one here, is module number two. So we got uh, two modules over here, and what's more important is in order to eventually combine or assemble modules together each one of them should have very well-defined specification. So you can, uh, for example, you can see for module number two, you can see about its dimension size over here, right? So these are the so-called uh, interface specification of your modules. Interface specification. Of your modules, of course, each uh, module uniquely should be identified by their interface specification. And later on, later on, we're going to see how these concepts can be adapted to software design. Okay, that's about the modules level. And when we go higher about composing the modules together, for example, this uh, exciting toy over here, the uh, the pirate ship over here. So this is so-called assembly of modules. Okay, you can see all the concepts over here are very uh, intuitive. You just have to know the terms over here. So we talk about modules, we talk about interface specification of modules, and we talk about the assembly of modules. And notice that many of the pieces over here may have multiple instances in the assembly, and so they can be reused. So reusability as well is a very important concept. So reusable for all the modules in the uh, final assembly. Okay, so that's your first example. Hopefully that really makes sense. And let's go on to the second example. Okay, so we talk about interface specification and assembly architecture. So you can think about the architecture is really about how you assemble different modules together in a way that will suit your purpose. The second example will be from your daily construction. So once you get uh, get to be more mature more, uh, and stronger, and you can actually construct your own furniture, for example. So uh, this is simply some uh, example from IKEA. So there's a real world, uh, real life example. So you got many different parts uh, of your furniture or maybe book stand, and then eventually you can assemble a uh, book stand over here. Okay, again, let's just revisit the concept we just talked about. So let's go to illustration here. and. This one here, very similar. So again, let me just, uh, some repetition might be nice. You can think about this is one module here. Uh, let me be careful. This is one module, module one, and this is simply just another module, and module three, module four, and so on. And so these are the modules. 
And then uh, over here, let me make it a little bit larger here. You can see this is actually maybe some part number which can be linked to their interface specification. So it's still very crucial for every module uh, or every equipment in this case to be specified with precisely how they're supposed to fit in the bigger context. So you can think about this will be the interface uh, specification. And apparently uh, on the right hand side, so now this is how the modules will fit together. So you can think about this will be the final assembly. And now you can see two instances of the same module are being used. So that's really about the reusability of the uh, modules. of the modules. Right? So now you can see the concept about modularity, interface specification, and also reusability. They are all applicable to every example for the uh, uh, modularity. Okay. okay, that's about the second example. And let's go to the third one. So let's move a little bit closer to our discipline. Let's say computer architecture. For those of you who might be taking some computer organization or architecture course, so this should not be strange to you. So motherboards are built from functional units, for example, CPUs. So what will be the module over here? So let me simply uh, switch to the illustration here very quickly. So you can see on the left hand side, so this is the interface specification. Well, like a rough sketch. It may not be as complete as it should be, but you can definitely look it up further. So you can see this is the interface, again, the interface specification of your CPU, right? It's about where is the switch and also power supply and also about the uh, address bus, data bus, and also control lines, etc. So these are the complete specification in order to fit the CPU into some uh, motherboard. And on the right hand side, this will be the assembly. The assembly over here, and then you can see there are the, uh, the various parts. For example, you might have some I.O. panel connectors, and also you may have some chipset over here, and etc. So these are the different modules that will be fit, fit together into a model board. So all to get, uh, they will try to work together in a way that can uh, produce the final functionality. And what about reusability? Well, in this case, well, of course, uh, some motherboards may have more than one CPUs uh, on it. So in that case, you're really reusing maybe different modules uh, of the CPU. Okay. Okay, let's switch to another example here. So that'll be example number four. Okay, so we got two more examples to actually show you. So this one here, uh, any one of you who may want to get a professional software engineering license uh, upon your graduation, you may have to develop safety critical system. And for safety critical system, it's really important for modularity to be the case, to be present, because you want to make sure when you build your system, uh, rather than building a single complex module at one go, you really want to develop individual models, uh, individual modules. Maybe you will delegate a certain set of modules to one group of engineers. You, you can delegate another group to uh, develop another set of modules, etc. So divide and concur is really the essence for modularity. So now I'll just give you one particular example here. It's something about function blocks. I'll show you concrete uh, code in just a moment. Let's say if you want to declare, uh, develop some nuclear shutdown systems, and then you really want to set up some alarming system. For example, let's say if you're monitoring the, uh, you're using monitoring sensor to monitor the temperature of your nuclear reactor. And as soon as the uh, reactor's temperature goes way too high, you have to trip to shut down the system. Uh, just uh, to simplify the example a little bit. Okay, so here I'm just gonna give you some, I'll try to give you some intuition. We don't necessarily have to go into uh, the deep details. If you really want to get uh, deeper details about this particular example, get in touch with me. I can give you more references. But let's just get some intuition. Let's say we want to develop a particular module over here called limits alarm. So limits alarm is simply just a unit that's going to check, for example, the temperature for your nuclear reactor should have limits. And then it has input, uh, it has the uh, various input one, two, three, and four. So it got four inputs of real number type. And also it got four outputs, one, two, and three, three outputs. So a very fundamental part for the interface specification is the inputs and outputs. The least you should specify will be their types. For example, Boolean or integer or even string. 
And then uh, this one is a little bit small, but let me just uh, move on to iPad here. I'll enlarge that to show you, okay? So now we just talked about the interface uh, input and output. Let me just annotate, that might be easier for you. You can think about this part here is the input for your part of your specification. And this part over here is the output. And of course, uh, output types. And then this is actually the module name. This is the, actually the module that we may want to build or you may want to reuse. And then, so this part here is a little bit like a textual uh, version of the interface. So this will be the interface specification. You can see over there, we're trying to say these are the inputs and these are the outputs. And then you're trying to give some informative comments to tell you what, uh, how each input output is supposed to work, uh, work with outside. And then as part of the interface specification, you may want to give some uh, informal requirements about how it should work. So I'm not going to go too much detail, but I just want to give you some information. You can think about the curve over here is like how the, let's say we talk about temperature, we are monitoring the temperature for nuclear reactor. Let's say the curve over here is about how the temperature changes over time. And then, so there are, uh, uh, some critical regions that you have to worry about. For example, let's say this particular region tells you that the temperature might have gone too high. Okay, so this will be the temperature gone too high. So that means as as your signal actually go from the beginning, so now it is okay, it is okay, it is okay. But now as soon as you go above certain limits level over here, you have to somehow trip the alarm. Or in this case, we'll simply set one of the output over here, if you remember, QH over here is one of the alarm outputs. So now in this case, we're gonna set the QH value to be one, which means true. So we're gonna set the alarm to be true. That means your temperature is way too high, okay? There are also other regions over here, so-called hysteresis regions, but we're, gonna, we're not gonna touch that. It's a little bit more technical. But again, if you want to get more information for this particular uh, setup, uh, get in touch with me. I'll give you more references. And finally, if you look at the assembly over here, again, this is assembly. Let's see how the assembly works. So I would say this is so-called a function block diagram. You can, uh, each individual module is a function block. And this particular assembly, it's a little bit more programming oriented. And later on, when you draw your design diagram for your uh, classes, uh, object-oriented classes, it will be somehow similar to this. Uh, we'll see another example in just a moment. Okay, you can think about like this. Uh, let me just uh, say each one of the modules is gonna be blue, okay? You can think about this is one module over here. This is just another module over here. And this is module number three. And this is module N. And this is just another, mod another module, okay? So we got all these modules work together. So how do they work together? Each one of them should really take inputs and generate output. So the way to think about it is like this. You can think about for module number one, so you can think this is like a division module. So division module is gonna take uh, some input over here and then it's going to generate some output. And the output itself can be reused but as the input for other modules. For example, this particular output is actually reused as one of the inputs for this particular module over here. And that particular module is gonna generate something, again, the output, and that will be treated as the input for this overall module. So you can think about the input and output for each module is actually working together, interacting together to overall, we're going to eventually generate this particular output for the limits alarm. Okay. So that's about the diagram here, but just want, to, want you to get an idea. Modularity is really about to divide your problem, your solution into individual module. For example, uh, you can have module one, module two, module three, and etc. And then each module has a good, uh, has a well-specified interface, input and outputs, and some uh, more precise definition about how they should work individually. And then you want to concur by actually combining all the modules together so they can produce some ultimate output. Okay, so finally, uh, I would like to give you 
just one more example that's directly relevant to this particular course. So now, now that we have seen four examples of modularity, modules versus assembly. So now, how is this directly applicable to our course? So modularity simply occurs everywhere, but now we want to apply it to software design. So now software systems are composed of well-specified uh, well classes. So now in the context of object-oriented programming, like in Java or iPhone, so each module is basically a class, okay? And then, so this will be an assembly, uh, a sophisticated assembly that eventually you have to know how to develop on your own. Remember I mentioned before, you're going to be given complete freedom for some lab or your uh, end of semester projects to define your own classes. This is one example. I'll just give you a little bit idea. Okay. Okay. Let's switch to this particular diagram here. Let me just make it a little bit larger so you can see it. Let me just point out the uh, the terminology that we talked about before. You can think about this is certainly one class. That's module number one, for example. And then this is just another module over here. However, you can see that module there is uh, put with many more details. So when you actually produce your design diagram, you have you don't necessarily have to supply complete details for every module. For some module, you can simply show their name. And for some modules, you have to give complete specification. For example, for each one of them, you may need to say for that particular class, what is the invariance? And then you can, you have to, since you are trying to communicate ideas to your customers who may not know about iPhone or Java syntax. So the best language of communication in this case would be mathematics. So that's why you can see we are using uh, universal quantification over here. And also we are using uh, the set membership symbol here. So we'll see more about how you can do design diagrams later. But for now, you just have to understand uh, in the case of software design, you have to make sure every module or every class, if necessary, should be shown in precise details using mathematics. Okay, so now that's about how module can be uh, occurring. So now we should really talk about how, how we can connect them together. And remember in the lecture number one, I mentioned there are two ways to connect your classes. Either you can do by client supplier. So this is one possibility of client supplier. And remember, you should always uh, connect from client to supplier. So now in this case, this is the client class or client module. And this is the supplier module. And you can see we got many instances of client supplier relationship in this case. And then uh, other than that, we also have inheritance relationship. And this is one possible, this is one instance for inheritance relationship. You can see, for example, sorted map cursor is a subclass of iteration cursor. Okay. okay, so what you really want to get from this particular uh, design diagram is to see you got individual modules and they, uh, they, if necessary, they should be specified in complete details. And also you got assembly of individual modules using either client supplier or inheritance. So, that's something, so this is directly relevant to how you are supposed to present your design in your design documents later. Okay, so we have seen four examples already about modularity. So now I would like to give you the formal definition. So hopefully now you have enough ideas. So as I present each ingredients of the definition, I'm gonna refer back to our diagram just to uh, remind you, okay? So I'm gonna define modularity using three aspects, basically three phases. So modularity refers to a sound quality of your design. So think about modularity as a criterion of judging whether your design is appropriate or not. So if to, to be a good design, to be a modular design, you must satisfy uh, modularity. So three parts. The first part is about divide. Second part is about specify individual modules. And also the third part is about concurrent. Okay, divide and then concurrent. How about the divide part? You want to divide a given complex problem into inter interrelated subproblems via a logical justifiable functional decomposition. What it means is, for example, if you go back here, for this particular problem here, you can see we are we have decomposed the solution for this particular problem into one module, second module, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So we got 14 different modules together to solve a single problem. Rather than you simply have a so-called Superman module, let's say you have a very giant module which simply take input and output 
and then that's it. So you have very big classes with thousand lines of code. That's not acceptable from the design point of view. So whenever you're given a complex problem, which uh, should be the case since you're now in a senior le uh, senior year le uh, level, and also later when you graduate, the problem you're given just cannot be solved by a single module. So you should really decompose into different modules. Okay, for example, let's say if you want to design a game, so you may want to solve different sub problems. Each sub problem will be turned into uh, their solution is a single module. So for example, you may want to have one module for the rules of the game. So it's more, more about the business logic. And also want, want a second module to characterize individual actor. Maybe you got an actor for uh, the battleship. You got an actor for maybe an enemy. You got a, um, maybe you got the uh, module for stuff fighter. So these are the uh, characterization for the actor. Each individual actor should belong to their own module. Okay. And also, finally, you may have to really present your game, maybe as a web interface or to really uh, on a mobile app or on a, as a desktop uh, application. So this is just an independent problem to solve for the for your original problem. So each of the one, two, and three, so they are independent sub problems, but together they should really present the, uh, the when you combine these three sub problems together, they should present the original problem. That's why you should really decompose your solution into different modules. Okay, the second step would be to specify each sub solution. For each sub problem, you should have a sub solution as a module. Okay, and for each module here, you should have a very clear interface. Again, if you go back to uh, this particular example here, for example, you can see for, let me just show you another one. For this particular module called sorted ADT, and that one there, you should really have a very clear and so, uh, clear and selective uh, presentation of its interface. For example, you may have to, you have to present invariance, and for every feature you have to present re, uh, require for precondition and also post condition if necessary, okay? So it's really important for the second step for individual module to really be clear about how they can be assembled together. Okay, inputs and outputs, and also the relationship between input and outputs. Remember in lecture one, we talk about the post condition being relating the pre-state values and the post-state values. So now in this case, whenever you talk about input and output, input should satisfy the precondition, and the output should really be related to the inputs in a way that will satisfy the post condition. Okay, so that's something you will have to keep reinforcing throughout the course. Okay, so for those of you who took uh, uh, the Unix uh, and C programming course before, so it, uh, there's a Unix principle to say, do one thing and do it well. So now every command in your, your Unix, for example, ls command to listing all the directories or cd to change to uh, some other directory. So each command is solving a particular sub problem. They are not trying to do more than one thing. So that's really the Unix principle that coincides with the modularity criteria. Okay, so now in your case of object-oriented design, each class will just be a module. Okay, so every module is a class. Each class is a module. We kind of use the term sometimes interchangeably. Okay, of course, if you don't program in object-oriented programming language, in that case, a module may correspond to other things. For example, if you program in functional programming, it might just be an individual uh, function or individual file. Okay, but in our case, it's a class. Okay, the third phase would be to concur the original problem by assembling sub-solutions, right? So now you can see that in the concur stage, we have to assemble in uh, either client supplier or inheritance. You can see we assemble using client supplier, assembly using uh, inheritance, and then we try to do, uh, we try to connect all the relevant modules together to present. So the blue, so the blue boundary over here represents the ultimate solution for the clients. So when the clients actually, the clients, of course, they don't, they don't have to understand how the, uh, how the internal architecture works. But for you as a designer, as a supplier, you have to uh, divide into individual module, specify individual modules, and then to combine them together using assembly, uh, either client supplier or inheritance. Okay, so let's go a little bit further. So now, a modular design is really something you would like to aim for, not just for this course, but once you finish this course, we would like, to, we would like that you will pick it up from as a take-home uh, value, that every time you're trying to design, always think about whether you really follow the, the modularity uh, criterion. Did you divide? 
Did you specify and did you concur uh, by assembl uh, assembling the modules? So now what does it really mean for modular design to satisfy the criterion? So once you set satisfy the modularity, there will be three uh, very desirable properties of your design. The number one is called maintainability. So which means every time if you want to fix some issues, you only touch the relevant modules. For example, for my particular problem over here, if I notice that there will be some maybe change on the functionality requested by the customer, or if I find some bugs in my modules, I don't really, I don't necessarily have to touch everything that's in my system. So for example, there might be something wrong about the sorting. So I only have to touch this particular module. So this is the only, oh, so I should, shouldn't put across. You can think about this is the only module I have to fix. I only touch that. Whereas all the other modules, I can uh, keep them untouched. So it's, it's a very important to see that, okay? It's about maintain, maintainable. So you don't have to touch everything uh, every time you want to fix something. Extensible, every time if you want to introduce some new functionality, you can introduce them by just by adding new modules without polluting uh, everything uh, in the system. For example, if I go back here, maybe I want to introduce another module for searching. So what I can do is, uh, let's just draw it. You will just introduce maybe another module over here and for searching. Once I put a new module there, and then I need to think about how can I connect that particular module to everything else. For example, you might just decide this particular sorted map is actually going to use the search as a client. Uh, so we are, I'm drawing a client supply relationship over here, right? So client supplier. Okay, just one example how you can extend your system by adding just adding modules rather than touching everything. Okay, and also it's about being reusable. Okay, I also talked about reusability already. So now you can see that for, uh, once I design this particular uh, search module over here, it can be reused by everything that might uh, demands that. For example, not only that the sorted map module can, can use the search module, and also let's say iteration cursor, maybe also want to use this particular uh, search module. So I can just draw another client supply relationship over here just another one, right? Reusing the same module without duplicating the uh, design or duplicating the implementation. So think about this first client supplier relationship and the second client supplier relationship, they rep represent this particular module is reusable, okay? Okay, so now finally, what you really want to avoid uh, is to do the opposite of modularity, which means you don't really want to design just a so-called superman module to do everything. It's definitely a no-no for your design, even if it might work for now. But later on, whenever you want to maintain or you want to extend or you want to reuse, a superman module will not uh, lead you for too far. 